Welcome everybody to the Clinical Practice Forum. My name is Sheila Pandey. I'm a nurse practitioner on the Supportive Care Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And in this session, we will be discussing oncologic emergencies in hospice and palliative care. In this session, we will review oncologic emergencies commonly encountered in the palliative care setting. This includes early signs and symptoms of these conditions to allow for prompt diagnosis, and we will review the approaches to diagnosis and management. We'll be focusing on using a palliative care approach to balancing the potential burdens and benefits of treatments for oncologic emergencies, always considering goals of care and prognosis. In all these conditions, we'll be reviewing the role of the palliative care nurse and nurse practitioner in identifying, assessing, and managing oncologic emergencies. Lastly, the importance of providing anticipatory guidance to patients and families will be reviewed with each oncologic emergency. So let's get started. Palliative care nursing has a natural connection with oncology nursing, since hospice and palliative care emanated from the care of cancer patients. And cancer remains the second leading cause of death in the United States. As palliative care nurses, we're routinely involved in symptom management of the cancer patient. And we should have a high suspicion for these emergencies because earlier detection in some cases can improve quality of life. Now, oncologic emergencies can be insidious with some taking months to develop and others within hours. And they can be associated with devastating outcomes, including paralysis and death. These emergencies can occur upon diagnosis, throughout treatment, and of course, during end-stage disease. They may be caused by the actual malignancy, its treatment, or a combination of both. Most, most oncologic emergencies can be classified as metabolic, hematologic, structural, or treatment related. The table here shows you some examples of each. Of course, is not an exhaustive list of all the oncologic emergencies that can exist. And today we'll be focusing on the oncologic conditions highlighted in green text. These are superior vena cava obstruction, hemoptysis, hemorrhage, spinal cord compression, and pathologic fractures. So let's talk about the general approach. Although each oncologic emergency has a specific approach to assessment, diagnosis, and management, there are some common general approaches that are taken with all of them. First and foremost is prevention. The goal for all of these emergencies are to prevent them if possible by understanding and assessing risk factors. We must be knowledgeable of the underlying pathophysiology of the condition so we can appropriately anticipate and prevent complications. Patients, families, and caregivers must be educated on the signs and symptoms of these conditions using a clear and honest explanation so they can report them to their providers and team for prompt identification and management. The role of the palliative care nurse in shared decision-making is essential here, and all treatments should be aligned with patients' goals of care, their values, beliefs, and preferences, and their overall prognosis. All patients should receive appropriate pain and symptom management as these emergencies are often associated with de devastating, distressing symptoms. So let's start off with a case for our first topic. This is a 73-year-old male with metastatic prostate cancer, currently on avulamab with bone metastases. He developed right arm and shoulder pain with tingling in the right hand and has developed a decreased use of this right hand. He's required oxycodone and acetaminophen for eight days standing with really no relief. And there's been a decrease in range of motion to this right arm. Although his sensation is intact, his hand grasp is getting weaker. A plain X-ray shows pathologic fracture of the right humerus and posterior iliac bone. Now this is a very common presentation for pathologic fracture and we're gonna talk more about this in the next slide. Oncologic pathologic fractures occur through areas of weakened bone caused by either primary malignant lesions like osteosarcoma, benign lesions like Paget's disease, bone metastases, or an underlying metabolic abnormality. The most common cause of pathologic fracture in cancer is from bone metastases from solid tumors and multiple myeloma. Solid tumors alone account for 80% of all skeletal metastases. And this is most common in breast, prostate, lung, and kidney primary cancers. Patients receiving stem cell transplant are also high risk for pathologic fractures. And other causes that can contribute to risk are osteoporosis, infection, inherited bone disease, and drugs like steroids. The incidence of pathologic fracture ranges from 9 to 29% in patients with bone metastases. 
And pathologic factors are the presenting feature in 30% of cases with multiple myeloma at diagnosis. The pathophysiology of a pathologic fracture goes back to the bone metastases that alters bone remodeling in the bone marrow and creates imbalances in osteoblast and osteoclast activity, which then weakens the bone and leads to the pathologic fracture. Now, common sites of bone metastases are spine, pelvis, rib, skull, proximal femur. So all these areas are at high risk for pathologic fracture. So now what are the clinical features of pathologic fractures? What can you expect to find from patients? Pain is usually the first sign of bone metastases and of pathologic fracture. The pain associated with fracture is usually severe, it's sudden, and the pain may be worse with activity, incidental, or maybe difficulty bearing weight on the affected extremity. Range of motion may be limited, like in our case, and there may be weakness, numbness, or tingling associated with the fracture site. Bruising, tenderness, and swelling near the fracture may also be present. Hypercalcemia may also occur from the underlying bone metastases causing a constellation of symptoms. The workup of a pathologic fracture is usually due to the patient complaining of pain. And pathologic fractures may also be found incidentally on routine oncology scans. Now, a plain X-ray can be the initial diagnostic test to assess bone structure and presence of impending or existing pathologic fracture. A CT scan may be needed for more accuracy and aggressive bone lesions. And an MRI is more sensitive and specific to differentiate a pathologic fracture from an insufficiency fracture. Now, whereas a PET scan may be used commonly in patients with lymphoma or multiple myeloma for staging and whole body screen for metastases. All patients should be evaluated for hypercalcemia, which is very common in bone mets, and the alkaline phosphatase may also be high. Lastly, a diagnostic bi biopsy guided by CT may be done for, before an intervention to confirm bone metastases if this already hasn't been established. Now, primary prevention is the goal when managing complications of bone metastases, such as pathologic fracture. The goals for treatment are to relieve pain, restore function, and avoid any further declines in their quality of life. So the management of pathologic fracture depends on the bone type, the anatomical location, loading condition, and of course, prognosis. So surgery for pathologic fracture can be a good option for impending fracture or those that are going to fracture or a solitary metast metastatic lesion. The surgical approaches include prophylactic fixation to prevent the fracture, plate and screw fix fixation, or intramedullary nailing for fractures of the long bone. Vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty for spinal pathologic fractures are similar procedures in which cement is injected into the fractured vertebra to restore height and relieve pain. Of course, prognosis should be at least equal or greater than the time needed to recover from surgery, and this can range from six weeks or more. So this approach may not be as appropriate for our advanced illness patients or hospice patients. And receiving a prophylactic stabilization may lead to better survival than needing a surgical intervention after the fracture has already occurred. There are several non-surgical approaches for patients who are not candidates for surgery. First is palliative radiation. Now this can be used alone, adjuvant, post-operative to the sites of bone metastases. And radiation can reduce pain and it can be given in single or multiple fractions. Systemic treatment for the underlying cancer can address metastatic burden in chemosensitive tumors. And we can also give osteoclast inhibitors such as bisphosphonates, denusumab, which can prevent skeletal related events and reduce pain related to bone metastases. Thermal obl ablation, such as radiofrequency and cryoablation, are approaches to destroy pathologic tissue and can provide some pain relief. For, pain that is a, for bone that is already fractured, aggressive pain management should be provided both with surgical and non-surgical approaches. Lastly, patients who can participate and benefit from physical therapy should get some referrals for evaluation, and rehab can really help by obtaining assistive devices or bracing so patients can maintain their function and independence. Now the palliative nurse's role in patients at risk for pathologic fracture is to provide education and interventions for prevention and early detection. Once pathologic fracture is identified, we can advise on activity restrictions, including immobilizing the limb, arm or leg, interventions to reduce fall risk, 
and encourage the use of an assistive device. It's important to help our patients cope with potential functional losses encountered after a pathological fracture. And of course, managing pain is a palliative nursing intervention. And let's use our analgesics. These may include anti-inflammatory agents, NSAIDs, steroids, non-opioids like acetaminophen, opioid analgesics ranging from morphine, oxycodone, others, and of course, our adjuvants like gabapentin. And for some, they may need chronic opioids for maintaining their function and reducing the pain. We should also be monitoring for complications associated with worsening fracture, bone metastases, and hypercalcemia. So let's move on to our second case. Now, this is a 55-year-old female with stage four breast cancer with metastases to the ovaries, peritoneum, currently on tamoxifen. She admits to back pain for two weeks. There's progressively worsening non-radiating pain, and she's had no relief with standing ibuprofen or acetaminophen. And when immediate release morphine is added, there's still minimal relief. The pain starts to radiate to the flank, and then she's experiencing numbness and tingling. Now her neurologic exam is normal, but range of motion is limited by pain. And the MRI shows T7 to T8 cord compression with extensive osseous metastases. So this is a very common presentation of spinal cord compression that we're gonna be talking more about in the next slides. So spinal cord compression is an obstruction of the spinal cord. It's caused by in infiltration of tumor into the vertebral body, leading to collapse or compression of spine by tumor. And this can cause progressive and irreversible neurologic dysfunction. Most causes of spinal cord compression are from metastatic disease, roughly 85%. The most common cancers associated with spinal cord compression are breast, lung, and prostate. But really any cancer can cause spinal cord compression and this can occur even in patients with curable disease. And the thoracic spine is the most common location for spinal cord compression, second being the lumbar and third being the cervical spine. And one third of patients will have spinal cord compression on multiple levels. As I mentioned, spinal cord compression can present at any time in the disease course. 80% of patients will have a history of cancer, and for 20%, this is their first presenting symptom. The pathophysiology of spinal cord compression is tumor invasion in the spine. It collapses the spine or it increases the pressure in, within the spinal cord. These metastases can occur in the anterior vertebral body, pedicle, or invade the spinal canal. When there's compression on the thecal sac, this leads to clinical signs and symptoms, which can range from either asymptomatic or to paraplegia. So let's talk more about these clinical features. It's important to take back pain seriously in any patient with cancer that is at risk for spinal cord compression. Delays in diagnosis can lead to loss of function. So back pain can be the only presenting sign or symptom of malignant spinal cord compression. 90% of patients will have back pain, and this pain may be localized, re referred, or radiating, especially if it's a lumbar spinal lesion. And the pain may be incidental with movement or lying down. It can get worse over time. T12 or upper thoracic lesions can be experienced as hip pain. And an important point to remember here, pain precedes neurologic deficits. An abnormal neurological exam may include sensory and motor deficits, including weakness, change in gait, and decreased sensation. Autonomic symptoms like bowel and bladder dysfunction and incontinence may be present as well. And when there is compression at or below the cauda equina around L1, patients will have these autonomic symptoms with saddle anesthesia, a sensory disturbance in the peroneal area, along with these symptoms and loss of reflexes and weaknesses, this, these are considered red flags signs for cauda equina symptoms and should be treated as an emergency. So in general, an abnormal neurologic exam, especially sphinx, sphincter disturbance, requires urgent evaluation. Now, just keep in mind, time is function. So the main goal in evaluating spinal cord compression is prevention. And the earlier diagnosis has major impacts on quality of life. And this can mean, you know, catching it early, the patient is continent and walking versus catching it late, the patient is incontinent and paraplegic. And the gold standard for diagnosing spinal cord compression is MRI with and without contrast. MRI has a high sensitivity, high specificity, and an overall 95% accuracy for detecting spinal cord compression. 
Now, if there are contraindications to obtaining an MRI, you can use CT scan of the spine with or without myelography. So the management of spinal cord compression is multifold. The focus is on relieving pain and preserving or restoring neurologic function. So when spinal cord compression is suspected, steroids are, are given as a bridge to definite treatment. Dexamethasone is the glucocorticoid given for spinal cord compression. This is usually given as a bolus, first around 16 milligrams, then scheduled doses throughout the day. Oral dosing of steroids is possible if you have no IV access. Now, steroids reduce edema around the cord, they alleviate pain, and they help maintain neurologic function. Radiation therapy is one of the standard treatment approaches to patients with spinal cord compression and should begin soon after the diagnosis or initiation of corticosteroid treatment, especially for those patients who are not going to be candidates for surgery. Radiation relieves spinal cord compression by decreasing the tumor size and can improve pain and quality of life. Now, there's no consensus exactly on the dosing and schedule, but this can range from 30 gray in 10 fractions to 8 gray in 1 fraction. And it really is going to depend on the patient's overall functional status and, pro and prognosis. Now, surgery can be an option for spinal instability or tumors that are radio resistant, and this is using decompression. The entire tumor or a segment of the tumor can be removed by laminectomy. To be considered a surgical candidate, patients will have to have generally a life expectancy greater than three months, or they have to have neurological damage for less than 48 hours. There's also other criteria, and these criteria may exclude some of our palliative care patients with advanced disease, and definitely some on hospice. And so pain management is a priority, regardless of the prognosis of, with spinal cord compression. After a thorough pain assessment, analgesics should be administered promptly. These options may include NSAIDs for mild pain, opioids for severe pain, and in pain crisis, a patient-controlled analgesia, IV opioids, may be needed. We can use our adjuvants like antiepileptics, antidepressants, along with an integrative therapies for a holistic report, approach. Now, chemosensitive tumors, such as some lymphomas, may receive prompt systemic treatment to address the underlying malignancy. In addition, we can use our supports like rehabilitation, Physical therapy and occupational therapy should be considered based on the functional loss and prognosis after acute management. So the role of palliative care nurses is a vital one in managing spinal cord compression. After diagnosis, it's important to maintain pain and symptom control and to monitor for further complications. For example, we're, we're assessing for side effects of steroids and managing constipation from opioids and spinal cord injury. As palliative care nurses, we can leverage our therapeutic relationship with the patient and family and assist in decisions about treatment and advanced care planning. Our role is also to provide support since a complication of spi like spinal cord compression increases the uncertainty around prognosis and can lead to hopelessness or difficulty coping. So utilizing our interdisciplinary team, including social work, spiritual support, may be beneficial for patients and families to process the event. Okay, let's move on now to our third case. This is a 49-year-old man with lung cancer currently on Paxitaxel. He complains of daily headaches. This is worse in the morning, and he's experiencing worsening shortness of breath with an occasional non-productive cough. His spouse notices his face is more swollen, especially in the morning, and on exam, there are dilated vessels around the neck and chest. A plain chest x-ray shows mediastinal widening. Now this presentation points strongly to superior vena cava obstruction, which we're gonna be reviewing now in the next couple of slides. So superior vena cava obstruction is a disorder of, the ven of venous congestion caused by compression of the superior vena cava. The term SVC syndrome describes the constellation of signs and symptoms from an obstructed SVC. Now more than 90% of SVC obstruction is due to cancer. Intrathoracic malignancy is responsible for most SVC obstruction cases. Lung cancer and lymphoma, including diffuse large cell and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, account for about 95% of SVC obstruction cases. Less common are the iatrogenic causes from a catheter or device. But remember, these are still relevant in the cancer population because many of our patients have a metaport or long-term access for chemotherapy that can cause thrombosis of the SVC. The incidence of SVC obstruction is around 4% in cancer patients. 
There's about 15,000 cases of SVC syndrome annually in the United States, and 60% of people may develop SVC obstruction before the cancer is even diagnosed. Now let's get back to our anatomy and physiology here. The SVC is a large valveless vein that moves venous blood from the upper half of the body, the head, neck, upper extremities, and upper thorax, and re returns it to the right atrium. It's surrounded by lymph nodes, which can enlarge and compress the SVC because its walls are very thin and easy to compress. An obstructed SVC leads to the development of collateral veins. This happens over a period of weeks. So if there's a rapid tumor growth, they're not, there may not be enough time to develop that collateral circulation, which usually leads to more severe symptoms and worse outcomes. So let's talk more about those symptoms. Obstruction of the SVC can lead to a wide range of signs and symptoms, which can worsen over weeks and months. Cough and dyspnea are the most common presenting symptoms. Patients may complain of head fullness, worse with bending, like in our case. And they may report feeling very fatigued because of all these symptoms that you see here associated with SVC obstruction. Common signs are going to be swelling of the face, periorbital, and neck area, especially in the morning after you get up from being supine for hours. Swelling of the chest and arms may also be observed, along with distended neck vessels and venous distension of the chest wall. Facial plethora is a ruddy complexion and cyanosis. These are skin changes that may be present with SVC obstruction. And Pemberton sign is the exaggeration of edema and flushing of the face when the arms are placed over the head. So important to note are what are life-threatening signs and symptoms of SVC obstruction. And these include those involving airway obstruction like strider, respiratory distress, and mental status changes from cerebral edema. And these should be treated as an emergency. So the approach to imaging and workup really depends on the symptom severity. Now the plain chest x-ray, like in our case, is the least invasive approach to start with and it may show mediastinal widening. Contrast CT can identify the location, extent of obstruction, if there's thrombus and status of collateral circulation. So this is a usually a helpful test to do. MRI can be used to distinguish between a tumor mass or thrombosis. Now these imaging can also be helpful in planning treatments like radiation. And it's important to note that SVC obstruction, the SVC cannot be directly imaged by Doppler ultrasound. So in life-threatening cases, you may need a contrast-enhanced venography as well. And you may also need to collect lab work to assess for platelets and coagulation in case anticoagulation is needed. So the goals of treatment for SVC obstruction are to alleviate symptoms and treat the underlying cause if it's possible. The priority here is to assess for and address urgent symptoms that may be interfering with airway breathing circulation if it is goal concordant, meaning that it respects their advanced directives or decisions on resuscitation. So you wanna know what that code status is. So you may also need an interdisciplinary team discussion to review the risk and benefits of treatment options before they're even presented to the patient and family. Now, definite treatments for SVC obstruction are listed here. Patients with severe symptoms or recurrent obstructions are best treated with endovascular therapy. Stenting can reduce edema and dyspnea in 90% of patients. Of course, there can be complications like bleeding, infection, and stent migration. And radiation is given for radiosensitive tumors like lymphomas or after placing an endo endovenous stent. Radiation can give quick relief of symptoms even within 72 hours of radiation. For others, this may take weeks. And the optimal dose of radiation is not yet, estab yet established, but in our palliative and hospice patients, one to two treatments may provide significant relief. Now remember, the larger the fractions of radiation, the more adverse effects you're going to see. Chemotherapy for chemosensitive tumors like small cell lung cancer can be the treatment of choice for milder or non-life-threatening symptoms, and especially if the patient is treatment naive. Chemo alone can reduce symptoms in about 77% of patients with small cell lung cancer, and this can also be followed by radiation therapy. For those uh, less common iatrogenic causes, a patient may be a candidate for endovenous thrombolysis or anticoagulation if thrombus is the cause. There may be reason to remove a catheter or central access if this is what's causing the obstruction. And drug therapy for SVC obstruction includes steroids, 
Prednisone and methylprednisone are both used to reduce inflammation, edema, decompress the SVC, especially in lymphomas. Diuretics can be used to decrease venous return to the heart and reduce pressure in the SVC. And opioids may also be needed to address dyspnea alongside these definite treatments. Now, the palliative nurse has many interventions we can be providing. Uh, supportive interventions like raising the head of the bed can increase comfort. We need to maintain upper extremity precautions. Avoid placing the blood pressure cuff and IV access in the upper extremities. For patients receiving definite treatment, we need to monitor for com complications from radiation like dysphagia or fatigue and for side effects of systemic treatment like thrombocytopenia. Providing gold concordant care in the event of life-threatening obstruction should be discussed in advance so we're prepared in those emergencies. And patients and families need, will need continued education and reassurance throughout the management of SVC obstruction, especially since be, there are body changes that may occur. Okay, let's move on to our fourth case. Now, this is a 67-year-old man with lung cancer who has been complaining of blood streak sputum for two weeks. The CT chest showed a large tumor burden in right lung and the right main bronchus and part of the esophagus. His treatment changed to pembrolizumab, which reduced the tumor burden slightly. However, the hemoptysis continued and increased to one to two cups of bright red blood per day. The pembro was held and he was given some steroids. And then suddenly the patient developed massive hemoptysis at home and died after an attempt at resuscitation. So this is a case of life-threatening hemoptysis. And we're gonna be talking more about this now. So hemoptysis is defined as blood expectorated from the lower respiratory tract. And this can range from small streaks of blood in the sputum to, or mild hemoptysis to more massive or life-threatening hemoptysis, which can be anything greater than 100 or even 600 milliliters over a day. Now, since it's difficult to quantify the milliliters of blood, life-threatening hemoptysis is anything that obstructs the airway. Now, lung cancer, especially small cell and non-small cell lung cancer, are the most common causes of uh, hemoptysis in metastatic cancer. Non-malignant causes of cancer include infectious, infections such as bronchiectasis, pneumonia, tuberculosis, or lung abscess, all which can happen in the immunocompromised patient. And other causes include pulmonary vascular diseases like heart failure or PE, Medications such as bevacizumab, a chemotherapy, and targeted therapy can cause massive hemoptysis in 9% of patients. So often, this is a big problem. The incidence of hemoptysis ranges about 20% in patients with lung cancer and can lead to death in 3% of patients with lung cancer. Most causes of hemoptysis are from the pulmonary arterial circulation, which is generally a low-pressure area and supplies the lung parenchyma whereas bronchial artery circulation is high pressure and supplies most of the endobronchial tree and is the most common cause of life-threatening hemoptysis. In addition, tumor burden from lung cancers cause blood overflow, which increases the risk for hemoptysis. So now that we know what causes the hemoptysis, let's talk about how it presents clinically. The symptoms of hemoptysis depend on the area of involvement. The most common symptom is blood in the sputum, and this can look like frothy sputum, liquid, clotted, or bright red blood. You wanna be able to differentiate hemoptysis from other types of bleeding like nasopharyngeal or GI bleeding. There may be associated signs and symptoms such as cough, tachypnea, voice hoarseness, wheezing, shortness of breath, personal of breathing, and changes in lung sounds. Sometimes bleeding may be happening in the lung without hemoptysis, so it's important to look for signs of airway obstruction. Other signs like petechiae and ecchymosis may be present in bleeding disorders. So now let's think about how we would go about evaluating this. Really, a detailed health history and physical is going to help you differentiate hemoptysis from other origins of bleeding, like GI bleeding. So for mild and moderate hemoptysis, you may want to collect labs like a CBC to see if this is chronic bleeding or determine the magnitude of bleeding. You may need coagulation studies to assess thrombocytopenia or other bleeding disorders as causes. Other testing is really going to depend on what you think the etiology is here. You may not need a full TB workup if you know the patient has lung cancer. And radiology studies may include chest x-ray or CT to evaluate the source of bleeding or PE and especially for recurrent hemoptysis. 
So bronchoscopy is often utilized in life-threatening cases where the goals are life prolonging. And a, and a bronchoscopy not only can it visualize the bleeding and identify the source, it's an opportunity to deliver interventions. You can suction, remove blood, remove a thrombus, collect biopsy, sputum, and there's other interventions that can be done. This can be done at the bedside. You can use a rigid bronchoscopy to get a better visualization or to, to suction for more volume. Again, management depends on the severity of hemoptysis and the goals of care. So for life-threatening hemop hemoptysis, if the goals are for aggressive life support, then intubation usually occurs with an attempt to reverse the underlying cause of bleeding. If the goals are to avoid life, life uh, aggressive supports then the patient or the patient is receiving hospice care, the goals are to provide comfort and alleviate distress. In both of these scenarios, the common goals are to prevent aspiration and death may still be imminent despite your resuscitative efforts. For non-life-threatening hemoptysis, the goals are to identify the source of bleeding, monitor the bleeding loss, stop the bleeding if possible, and treat the underlying cause again if possible. So let's talk some more about these interventions. So these are here listed for you some options to treat hemoptysis. External beam radiation can stop hemoptysis in about 80% of cases, especially those with unresectable lung cancer. Endobronchial tamponade is done with, with flexible bronchoscopy using a balloon catheter on the site of bleeding. Laser coagulation therapy is used for obstructing tracheal tumors using photocoagulation, and bronchial artery embolization can be palliative, where in, agents are injected into the bronchial artery to stop the bleeding. Similarly, epinephrine injections can be instilled to the site of bleeding, Ice sailing is less commonly used. And of course, surgery is reserved for life-threatening cases for patients with a longer prognosis. Now the role of nursing is multifold here in the case of hemoptysis. Positioning the patient to protect the airway um, of, in the non-bleeding lung is helpful. And if you don't know which lung is bleeding, then elevate the head of the bed to protect the airway as much as possible. During the event, you wanna know what the goals of care are especially resuscitation status, and you escalate then appropriately. For life-threatening hemoptysis, there may or may not be enough time to provide symptom relief with opioids or for dyspnea or anxiolytics for distress. But it is important to provide patients and families with emotional support because this can be a very scary event. And to provide anticipatory guidance on what to expect, having dark colored towels to reduce the visibility of the bleeding can help reduce the trauma experienced by patients and families. And we're gonna be talking more about what, what that is in the next similar topic. So let's get into our last case here. So this is a 48 year old female with metastatic oral cavity cancer, recently on immunotherapy with disease to the skull, neck, skin, and lungs. She recently had a PEG-2 for dysphagia and neck swelling and her last CT showed tumor encasement of the left carotid artery with slight narrowing. Now there have been no improvements of her disease with radiation or change of treatment to chemo. She declined a tracheostomy and her goals are in line with allowing for natural de death and she was admitted to an inpatient hospice unit. However, one day she develops a large volume hematemesis. There's bright red blood with clots passing from her nose and mouth and she dies within minutes. So this is an example of hemorrhage. Specifically, this is an example of carotid blowout, something that's less common, but when it does occur, it's something you don't forget. So let's talk more about hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is bleeding that can occur in many forms. This includes epistasis, nose bleeding, hematemesis, rectal bleeding, vaginal bleeding, direct arterial rupture, like in our case. And of course, we've already covered hemoptysis. Any cancer can cause hemorrhage, but cancers that grow near vessels are at higher risk to cause bleeding. And the most common ones include head and neck, lung, GI, and GU cancers. Hematologic malignancies like advanced leukemias can cause bleeding from marrow infiltration. Malignant fungating lesions are at, are at high risk for bleeding as well. And complications like liver failure or coagulopathies can increase the risk of bleeding. Other offending causes are drugs such as NSAIDs and steroids that can increase that risk. And so hemorrhage can occur in six to 14% of patients with advanced cancer. In head and neck cancer, up to 74% of patients experience bleeding in the final month of life. Bleeding is caused when a vessel is injured and open, so the pressure inside exceeds the pressure outside, leading to bleeding. And normally, coagulation stops the bleeding. However, any factor that alters the coagulation cascade 
can allow for continued bleeding and hemorrhage. And if those things can't be reversed, the hemorrhage may lead to death. So let's talk about how this appears clinically. Hemorrhage can appear from any orifice or location, and it can happen suddenly based on where it's bleeding from. These areas include the nose, rectum, genital, wound, directly from the artery. The carotid uh, blowout from the case is a sudden and often lethal rupture of the carotid artery or its branches as a result from the mass and, or, or the treatment. So this includes the head and neck mass or radiation treatment. With hemorrhage, you're more likely to also see changes in con consciousness, confusion, hemodynamic instability from blood loss or respiratory failure. Patients may complain of pain, anxiety, or dyspnea, which should all be addressed aggressively as possible. And some patients may present with hair road bleeding, which is bleeding that occurs about one to two days before the catastrophic hemorrhage. So this may give you time to perform a workup if it's in line with the patient's treatment preferences. Now, in regards to evaluation, first you wanna identify patients at high risk, and that's usually what cancer type it is, other characteristics and comorbidities. And then if appropriate, you may want to identify the source of bleeding. And this can be the cancer itself or structural problems or coagulation disorders. And a CT or MRI can be used to identify the source of bleeding, and it can be done if the patient is stable enough to endure it. For GI bleeding, an endoscopy or colonoscopy may be performed. And geography may be performed for carotid blowout because then you have therapeutic capabilities for endovascular stenting, of course, if the goals are in line. Now, because hemorrhage can occur quickly and mortality is high, the focus here is more on prevention and anticipatory guidance. Reviewing patient and family's values, treatment preferences, and code status are conversations that should happen early. Some patients may be eligible for the hospice benefit, and we can help facilitate that transition, as in this case. Patients and families should receive information on who to call when this happens, what to do, and how to prepare the bedside, especially if they're at home. They should be given a home crisis kit, which can contain the things listed here, such as medications, pre-drawn labeled, dark, large dark towels, gloves, a bin, maybe a suctioning device. Having warm blankets at home can help mitigate the cold, clammy feeling patients may be experiencing. And of course, reviewing the natural history of death that by hemorrhage may be helpful for the family and caregivers, even the patient, if they want to know. Again, ask for permission before you give that information. Now, as far as management, if bleeding is suspected, we can discontinue offending medications like blood thinners, um, it perform interventions like applying pressure and packing, and that can be done at the time of the event. For patients with life prolonging goals, there may be interventions that can be provided like transfusions, vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma, TXK, an antifibrolytic agent, and this can be given to slow the bleeding or to replace the blood loss. Local interventions may include radiation, if they can tolerate it, topical agents, endoscopic procedures, and endovascular stenting for carotid blowout. Other interventional procedures or surgery may be offered, but of course this, this depends on the prognosis and the severity of the bleeding. Um, and these, these treatment options may not really be feasible in the acute event where the patient is not stable and death may be in, imminent. So more likely what you will be doing as a palliative care nursing side is providing symptom relief and comfort, especially if the hemorrhage is expected to be fatal. The acronym ABCD is a way to remember how to approach terminal hemorrhage. First is to pro provide reassurance to the patient and family, stay with them, don't abandon them. And it's important as nurses that we stay calm because patients and families will be scared. Providing symptom relief with opioids and benzodiazepines should be done promptly, preferably through the IV and subcutaneous route if available. And lastly, you'll be providing end of life care and after death care. Maintaining the patient's dignity should be a priority throughout this event. So massive hemorrhage can be what is considered a potentially psychologically traumatic event and develop into a post-traumatic stress injury for those observing the incident, including nurses, family members, and caregivers. So bereavement sh support should be offered to family members since they may be at risk for complicated grief. For the medical team, it's important to debrief after the death of a hemorrhage. This should be done with your interdisciplinary team. Review topics like what went well, what didn't go so well, system issues, and the emotional aftermath. Bearing witness to a terminal hemorrhage is something that is hard to forget, and talking to others about it is a way that we can support one another.
So that ends this presentation, and here are the main take-home points of this talk. Cancer patients are at risk for oncologic emergencies, and that can cause severe symptom burden, loss of function, or even death. Early assessment and identification of these emergencies can improve quality of life and prevent loss of function. And nurses are central to helping patients and families who are at risk for these conditions anticipate and prepare for them. Having early discussions of advanced care planning can assist with goal concordant management of these emergencies. And of course, alleviating distress from symptoms related to these emergencies and providing psychosocial support to patients and families are crucial nursing roles. So here are references used for the information that you have seen in these slides. There's a few here. And lastly, these are some resources for information on oncologic emergencies. The ONS Oncology Nursing Society has several resources for topics. These topics aimed at nurses and nurse practitioners. ASCO, American Society for Clinical Oncology, has several clinical practice guidelines on these topics. And the last three you see here are from HPNA, and they can be found on the online store, resources for managing symptoms associated with these oncologic emergencies. So thank you for your time and attention, and I will be available for questions and answers.